Hi, I'm Kurt Loder with an MTV News special report on a very sad day. Kurt Cobain, the leader of one of rock's most gifted and promising bands, Nirvana, is dead. And this is the story as we know it so far. Cobain's body was found in a house in Seattle on Friday morning. He was dead of an apparently self-inflicted shotgun blast to the head. Police found what is said to be a suicide note at the scene, but have not yet divulged its contents. Cobain, who was 27, had reportedly been missing for about six days, according to his mother. The Los Angeles Times reported on Wednesday that Nirvana was breaking up and that Cobain was planning to undergo drug rehabilitation. A source close to the band told MTV News earlier this week that while that story sounded bad, it was better than what was, quote, really going on. That comment remains to be clarified. Cobain's body was found in a house in Seattle where he had previously lived and which he still owned. It was discovered by an electrician who had showed up at around 8.40 a.m. this morning, Friday morning, to do some work at the house. He looked in a window and said he recognized the body on the floor inside as Cobain's. Before calling police, the electrician first called a local radio station to break the news. Although at press time, police were declining to officially identify the body as that of Cobain, pending notification of next of kin, a reporter for the Seattle Post Intelligencer, who was on the scene, ID'd the body as Cobain's. And uh, several other news outlets have also gone public with that information. Cobain's wife, singer Courtney Love, had just canceled a UK tour. She was not over there yet with her band Hole. Her current whereabouts are unknown, but she is presumably with the baby daughter she had with Cobain, Frances Bean. For the, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, look back at Kurt Cobain, his music, the band's music, and the loss of a, real, a gentle and wonderful guy. David, of course, wrote this uh, Rolling Stone cover story on Nirvana, which uh, was from last January, when they seemed to have uh, begun dealing with their success and uh, were taking a little bit better. And the most striking thing about it, as I was telling Michael Azarad, is that he seems to be saying, I'm so happy. This is the happiest point of my life. I've never enjoyed a tour so much. What do you think went wrong? Any, anything can go wrong on a tour, as, as you well know. Yeah. You go out there and the initial buzz, and I think for him there was this feeling of, you know, I've been laying around the house, I haven't been on the road for two years, this record was a real bitch to make, um, I've been going through all this crazy family stuff, you know, trying to be a father, I'm out there, you know, I'm playing good shows, with the notable exception of the one I saw in Chicago. Yeah. Um, but it, uh, at Roseland, during the New Music Seminar, that was that was an awesome gig. Yeah. It's a trite phrase, but it was, yeah, it was an awesome great. gig. They came back to New York after the Chicago show where I interviewed them and just blew that New York Coliseum apart. Yeah. And But once you get out there and the more you do it, the pressures mount up and I think a lot of the old doubts might have come back. Um, who knows about old habits? I can't speculate about yeah. that, but I think his life in a way is kind of the, the you know, evidence of the old showbiz adage, you know, be careful of what you wish for, you just might get it. Yeah. And to find that it's not all wine, women, and song, and that, you know, what you're singing about and the songs you're writing about really have a much greater resonance in your own life than he might even have thought when he wrote them. Yeah. Um, I think it's, I think he was such a, um, a, a pretty basic guy. You know, in talking to him, he really felt that the songs he was writing were getting better, but that he really needed to turn a corner. Yeah. He had written the definitive Nirvana songs yeah. as, um, as played on Nevermind and In Utero, and I think he felt that there was other places yeah. he had to go. Well, he had to, I, think, I think the thing that struck me about Nirvana anyway was it seemed like punk finally broke through. This is like the world's greatest punk band. What do, what do you think their impact was on contemporary music? Well, basically, I think they said, you know, loud and live and loose is best. You know, they, they did not play according to the rules. And they came at a time when the rules were strangling the music. I think they, they just blew the 80s nonsense apart. Um, they, they knocked Michael Jackson off the charts. What better metaphor <laughs> for what he could have accomplished? Yeah. And you now have the Pearl Jams and all the other sort of, I hate the word alternative, but just to, yeah. just to use it. He said, this is, this is viable. We can make music on our own terms. We can do it any way we want. Yeah. And to hell with the rules, the major record companies, you play according to the way we want to play. But that takes a lot of responsibility, and it meant a lot of people were looking to him. He had so much to give, and he had so much left to write. And I think in a, in a way, and I don't mean this speciously at all, that I think he was the closest that his generation came to a John Lennon, yeah. in that you know he was writing very much from the heart, very directly, and he didn't play according to the rules. And the thing that I found really disturbing was that the number of letters that I got after uh, my original review of In Utero, in which I made that reference, people were saying, well, how dare you compare him to John Lennon? And I say, 
you know, look at their life stories, listen to the music. If you don't see the connection, then yeah. you're just not paying attention. And here's a guy who's a product of a broken home, never got along with his parents, had all these physical ailments, I and mean, it, it was not a pretty life. The thing is, you know, people say, well, you know, what did he say to his audience? Well, he was his audience. Yeah. You know, he was not the exception to any rule. In as much, except for the fact that he was successful. Yeah. You know, he wrote those songs directly from, if not personal experience, and experiences that he knew, and yeah. emotions and, and turmoil that he went through. And you can hear it in the way he sang, in mm -hmm. the words that he used, the metaphors, um, the sound of the guitars. You know, that all came through loud and clear. Yeah. And I think that it was, in a way, I'm, I really feel that this is a great loss. This is not just some, you know, rock star who couldn't handle success and took an easy way out. I think he, he really shows that, that there's a generation out there that, that really has to come to grips with um, their future. And in many ways, I think a lot of older people and parents really shouldn't look at this as like, you know, this is a rock star, I couldn't handle it. I say, this is your kids, think about it. Back in the mid-70s when punk rock exploded, the record business tried to slick up as much of it as it could and kill the rest of it, and it was sort of dismissed as a joke, but punk was very inspirational to a whole generation of kids, and Kurt Cobain was one of them, and you could see that force and that passion in the music they made. And punk really broke through with Nirvana, and we're really going to miss what they did, but their albums are still with us. Bleach, their first one, their big breakthrough, never mind, and In Utero. We hope there'll be some more. There's also Incesticide. Uh, there may be stuff lying around in the vaults, but Kurt Cobain is dead. We're really going to miss him. He was a very sweet man. Nirvana was a very, very bright and promising group.